Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's Tuesday, the 16th of April, and um, I'm getting a strong echo. I don't know what's going on here. Um, But anyway, we are um, live on the air from Phoenix, Arizona, and um, uh, we'll bring on to the show in a moment uh, our guest, Mr. Brad Olson. You've heard about him all week long, and of course, we've been advertising him on the front page of The Truth Denied. I want to wish... Um, everyone that was connected, uh, you know, to the Boston Marathon runners and that uh, the hor- horrific uh, bombs that were set off and all the people that were injured and now deceased, I am uh, just sending love and, and blessings to all of you. You know, we had uh, out of the state of Arizona – uh, about 250 runners in that marathon, and I did get a, a chance to hear, um, for, uh, you know, d- testimony, whatever you want to call it, uh, of those who were there, you know, fresh out of the marathon, uh, heading toward uh, airports and such. And it's just a very interesting unfoldment. I did cover it. I covered uh, Obama's uh, press to the nation, um, which was very short, and um, yesterday, so that everybody can follow through, I was also on the Boston Police uh, Twitter um, as they were tweeting out what they were going to do next, etc. And uh, I'm very well aware of all the aspects and the conspiracies and the um, the anger that the public, you know, the public is outraged by this. And of course, um, it's not too hard to connect the dots to see um, perhaps what's going to come out of this. Um, um, I, again, it's um, real important, people, that you don't buy into the fear um, that's propagated every day of our lives in this country and all over the world. It's just not helpful. Um, fear can be a motivator in, in some cases, but over the long haul, it will kill you. You know, So I'm, that's just my personal reminder. I also want to remind you that The Truth Tonight is a volunteer organization, and uh, we are uh, currently uh, in need of donations. We want to thank those of you who have been donating this week. And, um, you know, no donation is too small. And, of course, no donation is too large. Is That's how we look at it. And um, these donations that have been coming in, this says a lot about you, the listeners and the readers. So we much appreciate it. Um, some of what we do at The Truth Tonight as a reminder is we expand public awareness as well as connect our readers, guests, and listeners with one another, uh, forming a global information chain, if you will, of those who want to be part of changes uh, for the better in our world. And um, so join us you know uh, I want to thank those of you who've been emailing asking what you can do to volunteer you don't have money but you'd like to volunteer your services wonderful wonderful we can put you to work no problem um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for that and if any of you do want to donate just go to the truth com. there's donation buttons just click them and um, like I said any money in any form is um, good for us and helps us we have domain renewals and host renewals host site renewals we want to expand we want to continue to expand and and you, you you make that very possible for us. We're having trouble with Google and YouTube. We have been able to self-support ourselves until about four months ago. Some way, somehow, we don't know what's happening. Um, and we're not the only ones. Um, somehow, they're not paying for paying us anymore and we don't know why um and we've written them and as if anybody has a youtube account or youtube channel or a a blog site you know you know this is happening to you as well and there is nobody to write there is no one to write so um it's uh, all over the blogs at google and people are asking what's happening what what has happened meanwhile google unfortunately uh is still running all the ads on millions of websites and um Hopefully they'll straighten it out, and I would just want to put a prayer out to that because many, many, 
bloggers are writing me and they're not going to be able to continue. And this is very unfortunate. So some of them are going to come over with us for a little while and we're happy to assist. We're happy to get your word, your information out there. We're a highly a trafficked website. Uh, we have a lot of traffic. And again, we are growing exponentially so again thank you thank all of you who share our websites and our radio shows and speaking of volunteers revolution radio for those of you who do not know uh we have uh, many many hosts here i don't even know how many of my producer can give me a number that would be great um but i have no idea uh, 20 30 hosts i don't know every one of us are volunteers uh revolution radio was founded and set up by uh uh, Mike Wrigley, uh, we fondly call him and is known as Hawk because he's a night hawk. He works around the clock. He funded this. He put this station together about a year and a half ago. And we do – oh, thank you, uh, Kat. We have 45 or more hosts. Every one of us are volunteers, and we put together, as you well know – substantial awareness shows with guests like the guests that we're going to have on this evening and um, you know we also make videos out of these shows Um, Revolution uh, Radio's website on YouTube has the shows there and of course we have them at The Truth Denied and we also do articles and we give you all the information for our guests if you write us and you have questions for the guests we forward those to our guests Uh, it never ends so we are forming that information chain and together we can all do this and so those of you who are listeners and readers like i say you know a lot of people are very broke right now they don't even have five dollars to donate and that is fine you can do something you can share the information with others and that that really helps us all out so thank you again um for the most part we do continue our work and we are honored to have so many of you who support our work so once again thank you and many blessings next week thursday uh there's another show that i do it's a television show tribe tv so next thursday at uh one o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time will be doing another episode of GIC with o- the GIC owner Bernard Alvarez and of course myself so watch for the ads that will be coming up next week on the show uh, we'll also have uh, back to the show uh, one of your favorites and one of mine Dr. Will Spencer and some friends and we're going to talk about a few things go to the uh, schedule page on the truth denied really easy to find and check out some of the topics that we're going to uh, be um, uh, further knowledge for all of you on and um, we're even going to share a little bit I'm going to share a little bit with um, some personal things that have been going on that uh, have changed because of Dr. Will Spencer in my life and some of the friends that Dr. Will Spencer uh, has been working with some of my personal friends some for many years Um, so there you have it and of course I'm really excited Um, uh, this is going to be the first time that uh, my guest Brad Olson is going to be on the show we're going to dive into some subject matters like you know what is secret government and what's the third Reich and um, you know what are secret sciences oh I can't wait to hear about that what's backward engineering and who are the men in black and uh, topics as such as these I can't I can't wait we're just going to race into it and dive into it a little bit of background on my guest tonight um uh, you know, he's an author. He's a publication contributor. Uh, he gained uh, the distinction of an award-winning travel writer title in February of 2010 when his travel guide, Sacred Places in North America, 108 Destinations, uh, won the Bay Area Travel Writers' Top Gold Prize Award. Congratulations, first place winner for the 2010 Best Travel Book for the Planet Earth category. So uh, this is absolutely fabulous. His syndicated Sacred Destination nation's travel column for the examiner.com is available both as a national column and a local profile for san francisco the city where he currently resides brad is a travel columnist for yahoo uh, contributor network so he is also a contributing editor for the world explorer magazine oh my gosh i can't keep up with this man and he has written several rough guides uh titles including world party guide he has a passion for publishing obviously and very good at it, um, has uh, been a published artist since he was 14 years old. Get that. Talk about somebody who goes after their dream and follows their heart. Uh, starting in 1979 as a political cartoonist for his high school newspaper, he continued his craft five years later at Illinois State University's college newspaper. His comic strip was renowned for its witty and satire and biting criticisms. And a decade later, he founded Consortium, uh, Consortium of Collective Consciousness Publishing in San Francisco. 
Francisco, the city where his office is still located. The company has produced 12 books, uh, titles including In Search of Adventure, a wild travel anthology featuring 80 different authors. Wow. And uh, Key to Solomon, uh, Key to Solomon's Key is the Lost Key of Masonry by Lon Milo Duc- Duchetti was released in the second edition in 2010. Brad's first book, World Stompers, a gold travel manifesto, now in its fifth edition. You want to be Brad, I'm telling you. In its fifth edition was lau- lauded by film director Oliver Stone, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that name, as a super, uh, I'm sorry, subversive masterpiece of travel writing. And Publishers Weekly labeled it a quirky chain pleaser. His travel website relating to the book, www.stompers.com, was Microsoft Network's site of the week and continues to rank as a top 5% Lyco site. Uh, the latest book released by uh, CCC Publishing was The Tribes, uh, The Tribes of Burning Man, I should say, by Stephen T. Jones, which won third place in the 2011 Sharp Wit Award for Best Nonfiction Book of the Year. And I could go on and on, but I'm going to bring Brad on here because I'm sure he's just more exciting than I am at this moment. I could go on and on about his background, but let's dive into all these subjects matter and uh, get a little piece of Brad tonight. If If you have questions, please be sure to put them in the chat room or join the event page on Facebook. Um, You already have some questions there, and I'm sure you'll be coming from chat. If you want to call in, we'll take questions at the top of the second hour. You can call in. Write the number down, 347-688-2902. Without any further ado, welcome to the show, Brad Olson. How are you? Hey, Roxy. Thanks for having me on. You sound, you're very welcome. You sound like a, a really fun guy. You're, you're uh, obviously um, been around the world. Uh, 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 how We obviously know a little bit about how you got involved in this, but travel guides, interesting. How did you, what is the passion with you with that? What are you turning people on to? Well, as you said in the setup piece, uh, my first book, World Stompers, A Global Travel Manifesto, was... Uh, Written and produced in the mid-1990s, right when I came back from a three-year trip around the world. Totally self-financed. I was an English teacher in Japan and then set off on my own with a backpack solo. Saw the world at a young age, and it was like getting another college degree. In some ways, even more valuable to what I've been doing with my life, of course, because I got into uh, travel writing and so many other things. And I should just point out before I forget... uh, in my bio that I sent you, I haven't even up. Well, I didn't update with you, but uh, Future Esoteric, which we're going to talk about tonight, has won uh, its first award. It won the uh, Pinnacle Award for the best travel book uh, in the New Age category, best nonfiction book, I should say. So that's kind of cool. Well, I, and of course, that's the name of the show um, for tonight. And I was going to get into that with Future Esoteric. Yes, that's very cool. What does it mean? What does to be a future esoteric? What does that mean? Right. Well, you know, conspiracy theory as a term is really overworked and it's a loaded term. And even though I love Jesse Ventura's show, who you, which uses <laughs> that phrase, I, I just had to look for something else. And while future esoteric really doesn't have anything to do with traveling, it's kind of traveling of the mind is about the closest parallel there is. But what I've done is covered all the subjects that are not part of what I call the mainstream narrative in life. So everything that we're taught that we know from Columbus coming here over 500 years ago to the man on the moon and never been in contact with ETs, well, there's an entire alternative narrative on top of that. And these subjects are nothing short of being very esoteric subjects. And that's why the the word loans itself so well. And not only is it this book, but I've got uh, Modern Esoteric Beyond Our Beliefs, which is actually the first in the series coming out in nine months. So i got a lot of work ahead of me right now. Yeah, it sounds like it. Busy guy. Um and I look forward to your work. Um, I think it's absolutely fabulous, and I love that you covered some of the topics, and I understand what you mean when you say, you know, th- just the word conspiracy uh, alone um, brings up a lot of 
frustration for people, you know, uh, they hear the, <laughs> right? They hear the word yeah, and they're absolutely. like, oh God, another one of those conspiracies. Yeah. I don't think people even really understand what a conspiracy is, <laughs> you know, when it really boils down to it. But um, I do, um, where can people get the book? Just why don't we just let them know that right ahead, uh, ahead of the show. Uh, we did drop some links into the chat room. So which one of those links can they get your book, uh, Future uh, well, Esoteric? Well, directly you can get it off of cccpublishing.com, which is our publishing house's website. It's also on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, carry it. It should be in most uh, bookstores. If not, you can request it. We're internationally distributed through Independent Publishers Group. So a wide reach and range of uh, possibilities to order this book. Mm-hmm. And um, great. And and we'll also advertise that for you um, uh, after the show. Um, and we'll just keep that on our website. So, you know, if anybody's looking for your stuff, they'll find it. Um, now... Can we dive into the book? Can we talk about some of the subject matter that is in the book? Let's do it. Oh, I love it. So I think I think um, I'm going to go right now with one of my favorites. Um, uh, you know, who are the Men in Black? Can we start there? Who are they? I mean, are they real? Well, it, it's a great question, and this is basically starting in the very middle of the book. I break it up in three sections. We start out in the secret section, then it goes into the cosmos section, and then there's the utopia section. So right in the middle of the cosmos section are is the Men in Black chapter. And, you know, Roxy, I try to be as objective and out of the picture as far as my opinion goes as possible and just lay down what's known. What are the facts? And I should just uh, preface by saying that by using the title esoteric, this is a term that literally means it's only understood or practiced by a select few people. This is not information that I think is really ready for the whole world to understand, but the people who are feeling that there is more of a story than the alternative, than, than the regular narrative, uh, will really latch on to this book because it does delve into every one of these subjects, including the men in black. So to answer your question, it, it could be a number of things. It could be a uh, secret service type, very much human uh, government agents, uh, or it could be more of an ET nature. Now to, to define it, the men in black are always associated with phenomenon. And by that, I mean, Anything from a UFO sighting to even Bigfoot sightings to anomalies in the sky to even possibly time travel visitors. Now, what makes the men in black so unique is they are Johnny on the spot. They are there right away. They are so quick to intercept witnesses that they get to this person before they even make a phone call, before they even tell someone what they've just seen. They're visited. And when they are visited, these characters are very creepy. For one, they don't have mannerisms quite like we do. They do things that are really quirky, like they don't know how a pen works or a spoon. Uh, they, they speak in sort of this old 1950s style English. They wear the old style clothes of the 1950s. They even drive big old black Cadillacs from a bygone age. So, so that alone makes it kind of a suspicious or dare I say esoteric subject. But what's really the trippiest thing about the men in black is they're extremely telepathic and they will put pictures in these people's heads. They will not threaten them physically, but they will threaten them telepathically in such a way that the person who has just had this paranormal experience feels compelled to not want to talk about it. And then the men in black have done their job. You know, that is really interesting. I, I'd like to interject on, on that. I had a yep. friend who was an author for many years for a big UFO magazine, and I'm not going to mention his name. And he had a company, and the men in black – 
parked outside of his office every day for a while. And when he would leave, when he'd go outside of the office and try to approach the car, right before he hit the sidewalk, the car would start up and leave. And, of course, the windows were so dark that he couldn't see anybody that was inside. He never saw a person get out of that car, but it drove up to his place every day. And you know what's really interesting about this? If you're, you're kind of spooking me. <laughs> he ended up uh, saying that, you know, I think it's time to pack it up. He, he closed the company. He stopped writing. This all happened, by the way, within a matter of months. Um, stopped writing and then moved to another state and that didn't seem to be good enough then packed up this is a very good friend of mine and will not return phone calls or emails anymore and this all happened in a matter of a few months and you know what Roxy he's not alone a lot of people who have had these experiences with the men in black uh, the threats are not so veiled even though they're not saying we're going to break your legs they're putting mental images in people's pictures. And one of the things I talk about in the utopia section is superhuman abilities and our capacity to become telepathic. Now, one thing that they feed on is our fear. If we're afraid of them, they're already in the driver's seat. But if we can somehow match wits or at least make an attempt to shield ourselves energetically and say, hey, look, I'm a human. I was born here on the planet. I don't know who you are. This is basically my conversation if I'm ever confronted with them. But you're not welcome here. All I'm doing is telling a story here, Roxy. It's a very compelling story, but I realize it digs very deep, and I realize other people who have told this story have gotten really scared, and and I don't blame them, but uh, I'm personally not afraid. That's good. Yeah, yeah, and and that is interesting because, like I say, he worked in an area of UFOs, which you mentioned, um, the associations with the men in black. And um, he was a prolific writer and a pro- prolific experiencer as well. His work was very credible. And um, like I said, he's just disappeared off the face of I don't know where I don't know where he is. I have no idea. But that that that's very interesting because he did refer to them as uh, as the men in black. He was very aware that that's who they were. As a matter of fact, when the car first pulled up um, to their place of business, it was the secretary that noticed, and she ended up quitting within a few days. Wow! Just quit. Yeah, I mean, and all the car did was park in front for an hour or two and then leave. It would be there and then it would be gone. Um, I, you know, of course, Jesse Ventura, I think, covered, uh, you mentioned him, you know, the men in black as well. And it is sort of sinister, isn't it? Well, it is. And, and it ties into the entire agenda that perhaps a sinister E.T. species has on this planet. And, mm-hmm. and if you were to ask my opinion, I would say that, that probably they are uh, biologically created entities, not even necessarily uh, life forms like you and I born from parents, but more like a test tube uh, type creature. And they're here to do the dirty work. They're, they're probably mm-hmm. hybrids, and, and we can talk about that along with the underground ba- bases, Dulce, mm-hmm. say, New Mexico. There's supposed to be thousands of them underground uh, all throughout the state of New Mexico. Um, and this is where, I mean, geez, we're already going as, about as deep as you can go in this rabbit hole. But, hey, why not? Uh, you know, th- th- this is really the essence of it. This is the, the control agenda on this planet. And this is what they want to do. They want humans to be like we treat cattle. And in fact, they have the same kind of contempt for us. And when I say they, I'm talking about the greys. But more importantly, they have masters who are these Draco reptilian ETs. And people need to be very aware that these things are real. They live underground. And they're extremely telepathic, as well as having fourth dimensional capabilities. And what that means is they can astral travel at will. And they can get into the minds of people. And they've been called many different things by many different races uh, throughout the ages. Uh, ancient uh, Arabic people called them the jinn. Uh, Maghabarati text calls them the archons. And they're basically just out of 
the perception. Now, there's two kinds of archons. One are these amoeba-like uh, creatures that just float around. We can't even see them. Because let's face it, our, our hearing is very limited. Bats, for example, they communicate in a frequency higher than ours that we can't even hear what they're saying. You know, like a dog whistle. You can't hear it, but a dog can. Same with our vision. We have a very narrow range of what we can see. But I just learned this recently. If you were to take an infrared camera, you can start photographing these archons. And these Draco reptilians can also be photographed. And I've seen pictures of them in none other place than Washington, D.C. And they look just like uh, the big winged Draco type creatures coming down and uh, settling in somewhere and doing their dirty work. Right in the middle of a nail-biting story from Brad Olson, if you're just joining us. You know, the Archons, you were mentioning the Archons. It's interesting because you're the third guest this month that has brought up the Archons. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's an important subject, and I'm glad uh, other guests are talking about it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I never heard of them until this month, honestly. So um, and this isn't, you know, people that are doing UFOs. I mean, they they bring the archons up no matter what they're talking about. Um, are the archons at this point, um, do you think, in, in your opinion, um, first of all, have you ever have you ever had any experience with one of them, Brad? Well, I don't really know. Because I'm a very positive and a very happy person. I've never been depressed a day in my life. And one thing I know is that they can't really get through to people like me. Because as I said earlier, they feed off of our fear and our anxiety and our anger. And I just don't do that. So they would have a hard time with me. Uh, but who's to say? I mean, I, I've taken a lot of photos and I've seen the orbs in those pictures. Maybe that's a... Uh, an element of, of the archons, the amoeba-like ones. The other archon that's uh, frequently spoken of are, are lizard-like, are, are reptilian-like. So uh, people need to be aware of this. And, and you know, I was thinking the other day, we should get infrared cameras on all of our uh, uh, elected officials and, see, and also to detect if they have uh, implants. Because look at how crazy things are. We thought Obama was going to do all these great things and change the world. And what does he do? He just goes right along with the Bush agenda. So, you know, maybe he's implanted. Maybe these things, I'm sure they are hovering all around him. Because here's something that, that your listeners need to realize. All of our systems in this planet, everything is a great big hierarchy. And what I mean by that is there's a very strict chain of command, for example, in the military, and in government, and in corporations, and everywhere you look, you've got a top dog somewhere or a, a board of directors. So if you wanted to, say, implement your world control agenda, you only need to get inside the heads of about 300 people on this planet. The Pope, for example. Who knows what that last Pope was going through? He's a weird one. But... Um, my point is, if there were these archons getting into people's heads, they would probably be more attracted to those people that wield great power. Oh, sure. Um, it's so those who control the masses. So, of course, they'd want to control those who control the masses. <laughs> it makes yeah. sense. Um, now, let, let's back up a little bit because you are talking about this strict chain of command and so forth. Let's talk about secret government for a moment. Um, sure. In your opinion, what is the secret government and what are their primary motives? What, what, are, they, what are they up to? Who are they? Yeah, th this is not a question that I could really answer in, <laughs> in a few minutes, but I'll do my best. Basically, yes. Uh, part of the alternative narrative is we have these control groups. And the way I cover it in future esoteric pretty much pertains to the UFO secrecy issue. And it was explained to me long ago that you cannot really understand UFOs or ETs unless you interject the human element. And what I mean by that is there are 
these individuals who are part of the secret government who are really calling the shots and who are controlling things and maybe at a very malicious level too, I might add. Uh, and this has to end, you know, we, we need to end this uh, embargo on truth. And, and I've had lunch with uh, Dr. Stephen Greer and I've met Steve Bassett and I completely applaud their efforts to once again, uh, hold hearings down in Washington, D.C. to try to wrest control out of the secret government. And But the thing is, they won't do it. They have no motive to do it. Plus, they painted, painted themselves into a corner. So it, even if they wanted to, and, and my understanding is some of them in the Majestic 12 group, although they've renamed themselves, they do want to make disclosure. They just realize they can't. Because of all the uh, implications, such as, well, why didn't you tell us sooner? What else are you trying to hide? What are the possibilities of using this technology in different ways? Uh, and then you have things like, uh, l l let me just put this out there. Look at what's at stake. We're talking about some of the greatest secrets ever held. We're talking about anti-gravity. We're talking about free energy. We're talking about space travel. We're talking about time travel. These are all things that humans have been working on and experimenting with. These are the secret sciences and secret science chapter of my book. And they have been a very closely guarded secret, more top secret than even the hydrogen bomb. Why do they want that to be kept such a secret, by the way? What, what, what do you think? Why? Well, I mean, look what's at stake. If mm -hmm. free energy came out, and that's a chapter in my utopia section, petrochemicals, <laughs> uh, burning gas, burning coal, nuclear energy will all go the wayside. We don't need it anymore. And that's the biggest corporations on the planet, our energy companies. If we start learning about our true nature, who we are as I'll even say it, interdimensional beings. We do have these capacities to become fourth dimensional and to bend spoons with telekinesis and become telepathic. But again, we're not being taught this. Th these are the secrets that have been hoarded. Now, I'm going to expand a lot more in this in, in the other book, Modern Esoteric, which is basically everything looking back up to the modern age. So I'm going to look at all the secret societies and... Uh, uh, mystery schools, and many of these traditions have tapped into this and have gotten humans to the point where they can be astral travelers and become superhumans. And again, this is very esoteric. That's the, that's the perfect word for what I'm describing here. Whereas the book Future Esoteric, which is out now, is is looking into the future. And mm -hmm. that future is going to include E.T., Interesting. You mentioned that the Majestic 12 group has changed their name. Do you know what it is now? Well, I understand they've added more members, and I don't know what the name is. It, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. They could just call themselves what they want pa to call Popeye. themselves. <laughs> but they have to keep it uh, something that won't be picked up. But apparently there haven't been any uh, data dumps on what the Majestic group has been up to since about the 70s. They've uh, clamped down on the leaks that uh, expose them. And, and the original 12, we know who they are by name. Yeah, I'm, real, I'm fascinated by that, that group. That's why I asked you. Um, now, with the, again, with the secret government and the motives and the clamp down on, you know, uh, interdimensional travel, et cetera, et cetera, there are whistleblowers coming forward, though, don't you agree? Who are oh, starting to tell. Okay. Um, for instance, I have um, Andrew Bushago coming on the show uh, next month, and he is a chrononaut. And uh, their whole team working with NASA, um, several of them have become whistleblowers. They've just gone completely mainstream and have have uh, let it out, you know, the cat out of the bag, so to speak. But what's happening is most people don't believe it. Well, most people didn't believe the Earth was round 500 years ago either, and look where that went. I love that. I love the fact <laughs> that we have to remind ourselves that there was a time where they thought the Earth was flat. 
not too long ago either. No, that's not really that long ago. So interesting, yeah, interesting. Or that the Earth goes around the sun or vice versa and all the rest of it. So, um, no, I, I love it. I love it, the expansion uh, for us. Now, do you think that humans, do you think that um, from, for the most part, uh, these uh Archons, these uh, even the amoebas or the lizard-like reptilians, and so are they integrated with society or are they hi- hidden, or are they just are these are these other species, if you will, ETs, whatever you want to call them, are they integrated with society? Could I be standing next to a hybrid and not know it? Well, let, let me make a real clear distinction about ET, and this is from Kerry Cassidy and the Project Camelot crew say this quite a bit on their interviews when they discuss it, that, there, that we can really classify two kinds of ET. There are one that are service to self. And these are the greys, these are the dracos, these are the uh, archons. They have their own agenda, and they're here to treat us like we treat cattle. You know, they, they have a lot of contempt for us, and we're just part of their agenda. But there are other ETs who are in service to others. And those are the ones that prefer to stay a lot more hidden. And perhaps they have a lot more to lose if their cover is blown. So it's my understanding that there are ETs that look almost identical to us. That they could walk by you on the street and you would not even know. They're very human-like in their appearance. There are others that are just off the charts. And, And the variety of ETs, my understanding is... It's kind of like the scene in Star Wars when they go into the bar and they pan around (laughs) the bar and you see all these different kind of characters, maybe not with eyes coming out of uh, socket tubes or anything like that. But there are lizard-like people. There are insectoids. There are these grays with real frail, skinny bodies, but great big heads and wraparound black eyes. And then on top of that, there are many different species of grays. So, I mean... This is how deep the rabbit hole goes, because none of this is being told to us. We have to go through uh, people who have been abducted, uh, some whistleblowers from the government who have actually seen these things. Uh, Sometimes, you know, they're dead, of course. Others, like Phil Schneider, who went underground and was part of this uh, conflict with them in the 70s called the Underground Wars at Dulce in Area 51, uh, and taken together, you see, this is what I do. I take all of the data points about these things, and I'm a voracious reader. I'm always looking into it. I've been into this since I was a little kid. That's why this is a very natural book for me to do, even though my background is traveling. I take all these data points, Roxy, and, and I look at what, what the bell curve says about them. You know, for example, uh, Roswell. You've got Some people that say that the disc that crashed was a weather balloon. Okay, that's the government cover story. And that has changed several times. They couldn't even get that right. And the the alien bodies that were recovered were test tube babies. Okay, well, that's the regular narrative. If you want to go that way, go that way. But by far, the most data points suggest that this was an ET crash and these were ET bodies that were recovered not only et bodies but the gray species um there's another writer who i have tremendous respect for um who says that the et was nazi but you know he's alone in that opinion basically whereas the huge amount of witnesses the huge amount of researchers the huge amount of whistleblowers who come out on roswell say the same thing and when that happens when those data points are at the top of the bell curve, that's the story that I'm looking for, and that's the narrative that I pursue. Makes sense to me. Um, so, with that in mind, Brad, um, you know, you just brought up Nazis and so forth. <laughs> uh, I, I have to go here. Um, Do it. Okay. So, does Nazi Germany stand out as something very different on the planet? Is it a hub? Okay, let, let's uh, let's start. I mean, the I'm going with intuition here on this. Uh, <laughs> is it, uh, you just said something that just struck a chord with me. So, it, is it some kind of hub? But go ahead. 
let's just keep in mind that the Third Reich never surrendered. Mm -hmm. Germany surrendered after World War II. Italy surrendered, but the Third Reich didn't. And some of the most highly guarded secrets of the Third Reich were never recovered. And what I'm speaking of is the bell, which was this prototype for time and space travel, um, as well as a fleet, not just one or two, but a fleet of UFO-style flying craft. I'm talking disc-shaped craft as well as cigar-shaped craft. This was where Nazi Germany was at in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine where this technology has gone in 70 years? Mm -hmm. And where it has gone is underground. And, and I mean that literally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, Area 51 from whistleblowers like Bob Lazar uh, speak of Papoose Lake and the S4 complex that has uh, roll-up doors that resemble the side of the mountains and the craft come in on these giant uh, conveyor belts and go down many, many levels. But uh, where this goes with the Nazis is at the end of the war, and I found this now on several different uh, uh, excerpts, is that Hitler knew he was losing the war. And he went to his most uh, trusted aide, Martin Bormann, who is the money man of the Third Reich, and this is a direct Hitler quote. He said, Bormann, take your treasure and bury it and start the Fourth Reich. Now, what is the Fourth Reich? Well, we know that about 100 U-boats of Nazi Germany just went totally missing. They went missing, and they've never been recovered. An impenetrable fortress for our Fuhrer. Did I lose I you guys? Uh, I think uh, our producer lost us. Uh, oh. Uh, and so we're back on the air, I guess. I don't know where we are, where we're at. I'm so sorry. You were right at a really crucial point. Yeah. And I completely – you were talking, and I, I – this is about four minutes ago. Okay. Well, I was discussing what happened to the uh, – can I come to can life. I come to the party too? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Why not? Well, you were talking about the Fourth Reich, and you were talking about you 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 know where I left off with you, but hopefully the audience was hearing everything. I don't know, but um, the you were you left off with me about the ships Thank that you. disappeared. Right. Well, that that uh, that you, you we've lost. What happened to the Hanabu? fleet of crafts. We don't know what happened to the bell, which was this prototype uh, used for anti-gravity experiments, free energy experiments, as well as space and time travel experiments. None of these were recovered. So the thinking is that the scientists that came over to America in Project Paperclip, such as Werner von Braun and others, they were just they were just uh, minor players in the big picture of what the Third Reich was working on towards mm -hmm. the end of the war. And the thinking is they took this stuff down to uh, Antarctica, where they know they could store it away. And I'm not sure if you, you heard, but the top admiral of the Nazi Navy, Admiral Dolent, let it slip in 1943 that the Reich had created an impenetrable fortress for the Fuhrer. Now, there's some that think that Hitler didn't even die after World War II, that he escaped like Martin Bormann did and went down to these bases. Now, isn't it interesting that fascism raised its reary, ugly head in the 1950s with Pinochet and Chile and Argentina was the next uh, outward fascist governments that we saw? And isn't it also interesting that... Uh, they had these U-boat bases down in uh, Patagonia, Argentina, as well as several of the islands down in the South Sea there near Antarctica that never were really understood or discovered. Um, and then in, in the 1946, 1947, 
Admiral Byrd was going down there on an expedition to check out Antarctica. They had some intelligence. Mm -hmm. And their armada was confronted two months into the six-month expedition. A destroyer was sunk. There were witnesses that saw a disc-shaped craft come up out of the ocean. They came and they took out just one boat. And they moved so fast that none of the anti-aircraft guns could even get close to them. They came back and Admiral Byrd testified to Congress that there were crafts that could move so fast that they could go pole to pole in one day. <clears throat> so I think clearly what he's describing here wow. is this is where the missing technology went. Mm -hmm. And... Martin Bormann started Nazi International, a.k.a. the Fourth Reich, a.k.a. the New World Order, is how it's rearing its ugly head now. Interesting connecting the dots. And with, with that in mind, um, this is fascinating stuff, Brad. Really fascinating stuff. With that in mind, what... Uh, there's, it seems there's so much proof, you know, of putting these pieces of the puzzle together. It seems that there is a lot of proof. Uh, it's not hard for me to digest it, um, and I don't think it will be for the listeners at all. But, um, you know, what is the media? They they have a a place in all of this mainstream media, um, <laughs> right? We all make fun of them now, don't we? Sure, but, they have a place, but people need to realize they're owned by the corporations. Mm. They're owned by the same people who are calling the same shots. So they can't be trusted. And, of course, you know they, they handle things like the CIA or anything to do with the New World Order with kid gloves. They don't really tackle the problem. They're not investigative reporters anymore. And thank God we have the Internet. Thank God we have an alternative media because mm -hmm. up until 10, 20 years ago, you couldn't get access to this information. You mm -hmm. couldn't watch specials that aired in Russia with English subtitles about the Antarctica bases until recently. Because, you know, the KGB was spying on the U.S. and still is under a different name now, of course, in the new Russia for 70 years. So they have a whole dossier of information that's come out especially when the soviet union broke up there was a huge amount of information that went out to the highest bidder mm -hmm. and you know soviet union had a roswell crash they have an alien autopsy video that's been released they have a lot of documents that have gone out to describe their own secret government their own manipulations and experiments with this technology so the the the, the russians and then i should point out that uh, right around christmas time the president of russia former prime minister Medvedev, made this slip i don't know if it was intentional or not i think he thought that the camera was off and one of the reporters asked him about uh what do you know about et's and he said well i'll tell you it's every president gets a uh, little portfolio of all the information and we're briefed and Medvedev even brought up the men in black and he said you should check out this Russian documentary about it which isn't like our movie the men in right. black which is just you know a total joke but a real documentary stating the facts about what's known about them mm -hmm. so do you think that they toy with us the information you know, that is released and when they do, or is this just one big game? I'm, I'm really curious about it. Like why, why let anything out like that? If they want to keep a, you know, a wrap on it, why, why, why let any of this information out? Well, of course we know that there's disinformation, which are half yes. truths yes. and ways to throw us off. But as I was uh, describing earlier with superhuman abilities, if you live your life, in a very pure kind of way, such as you don't lie, cheat, steal, deceive. You do everything because it's the right thing to do. You then start to achieve some of these abilities. And one of these abilities is the capacity to see things for what they really are. 
and in my book I call it uh, the second chapter in the utopia section, the age of transparency. And you can just start seeing when disinformation is being given to you. It's really cl quite clear, and it's a great thing to have. I mean, it, it's a way for someone like me who's nonviolent and practices nonviolence in, in all aspects of my life to be able to cope with and we're back at the top of the hour with our guest, Brad Olson, uh, future esoteric and having a fabulous conversation. Um, Brad, let me uh, tell you a few things that people are saying right now or questions that people are asking. We, I can just throw, throw them at you for a moment. Um, uh, Claudia wanted to know, she said she was particularly interested in and concerned with the NASA-Nazi connection. Is there such a thing? Oh, you bet. That that's what this is all about. That's mm -hmm. why it sounds uh, like it. Operation High Jump is still classified material. That's why NASA stands for never a straight answer. <laughs> uh, you know, w w what we're talking about also is the secret space program. And this all started, at the very least, it started in 1947 with the recovered crashes at Roswell, and there are several others, Aztec, New Mexico, and some others uh, around that time. And when that happened, these parts were all brought to secret laboratories, um, and the best of our scientists started looking at them. And that's what backward engineering is. It's taking the parts and trying to put it together as a whole. Uh, and basically, it's been said that every year that they've been doing this, backward engineering, that this secret space program has made a jump of 44 years above the rest of us. So now fast forward to today, and you've got humans that are up in space, that are in some of these uh, ships, and, and it was disclosed by this uh, gentleman in Britain who had gotten into some of the archives and, and looked at photographs and transfers uh, and saw the name of a few of the ships that were USSS, United States Space Ship. And it, now he, he's, been, uh, he's been wanted by the U.S. for quite a while. His name's Gary McKinnon. Uh, but finally the British backed down and said, no, we're not going to extradite him. But this is great evidence that the U.S. has been maintaining a secret space fleet. Now, if they were to advance 44 years every year you're talking about a breakaway civilization is what they're now called who are hundreds of years ahead of the, all the rest of us and of course nasa knows all about it nasa knows all about the bases on the moon bases on mars and quite a bit of the et uh scenario as well interesting hello yeah, did that answer the question? Yes, it did. I'm sorry. I thought we were losing you again. I was like, good God, what's going on here? Um, yes, uh, it certainly did. And um, it, there's a, another question. Well, it's not really a question. There's a, a woman named Eileen McLaughlin, and she wants me to do, do her a favor. She's got about 15 postings right now underneath your, your poster, your ad poster. Um Brad. Yeah. Okay. So she says, Roxy, do me a favor and tell them there are no more Draco and Hydra reptilians on the earthly plane or Mars, the moon, or the entire Milky Way galaxy. Uh, she talks about the uh, Andromeda Council, uh, Silver Legion uh, for May 26, 2012, how they did a combined special ops. And uh, it's called Cube Stomp and Sweater, I guess. We're organized mm. at beginning as stealth operations, over 250 Silver Legion Special Forces soldiers, as well as small number of Galactic Federation, not the Galactic Federation of Light, but the Fifth Dimensional Galactic Federation. On and on and on. I'm, it's too long to read. Uh, I'm sorry, Eileen, I'm not going to read all of this. Um, but... She wants to let you know that they have taken them out uh, and uh, uh, bombed what is called the cube and gotten rid of them. And then I, I, I guess the uh, the remainders are the grays, Sirius B, and hybrid grays. The mm -hmm. only things left are, sorry, indigenous rep reptilians, the grays, Sirius B, 
from Sirius B and hybrid grays. That is a great observation, and I'm right on that tip with her. Of course, there are these councils in the universe. They're very, very aware and present here observing us on Earth. Let's just say that what's going on on Earth right now is the greatest show in the galaxy. Mm. This is a very, very unique situation that we're in right now because, one, we're coming on with this incredible technology, and two, we're still totally being hoodwinked by this control mechanism that wants to keep us all enslaved, that does not want to give up these secrets, that wants to keep them for themselves. So your, your, your caller, your uh, blogger is absolutely right. They are removing them, the Andromedian Council, and I'm very well aware of this. And wow. they have gotten quite a few Dracos, not quite all of them. As she said, there are still some indigenous ones. There's still some grays, especially underneath Los Alamos, Dulce, New Mexico, as well as some that we have captured ourselves and are working with our scientists at uh, S4 Papoose Lake and Area 51. Mm-hmm. Now, you see, uh, this is a real... This is what the British call a sticky wicket, because these entities, most of them, were born on this planet. Uh, and we should talk about the prime directive, which is in the mo- movie and TV series Star Trek, which is that these benevolent races cannot directly influence the evolutionary trajectory of planet Earth. And if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Why would they want to? Why would they want to come down here and be our babysitters? They want us to do it, and they're helping us in ways that are not so overt. And by doing that, they are clearing these out. You know those uh, really odd earthquakes that we had about um, two years ago? There were 5.5 earthquake outside of Washington, D.C., and then another one uh, in central Colorado, two places where they very rarely ever see earthquakes. Well, those were clearing out some of the underground bases, and they well, did. Well, that's it. that's the rumor, you know. And and uh, Brad, what about all these booms that are happening all over the United States? All the, of the, the United these States giant all booms, the world. and and the world as well. I mean, some people think it's the Earth, you know, sort of making a sound. But are, are you more inclined to think that they're clearing out these underground bases? Yes, I do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is right along lines with what your uh, blogger uh, mentioned as well, Mm -hmm. that they are taking out the the, the ETs who are service to self, who are doing the most amount of damage, and who are aiding those top-of-the-hierarchy human beings. Now, it's been said that uh, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, they're not the generals. They're more like majors and captains. Because the real generals are these indigenous reptilians that are, some of them are still here. I think there are still some that are here. And they also need to be removed. Now, you see, they have the position that you can't take us. You can't just take us out of here. We were born here. This is our life and this is what we do. And some of the humans are cooperating with us, like the Rothschilds and the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, I mean. And, and it kind of makes sense that, yeah, they would have certain humans, the top of the hierarchy, that have a stake in all this. But it's my understanding that, yes, most of the reptoids have been removed from this planet. And now, for the first time, these very influential control group people have lost their fourth dimensional backup. And that is huge. Because they can't manipulate us the way they used to. Now, all of a sudden, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers are just human beings like you and me. They don't have this ability to uh, manipulate the people they want to on this energetic or fourth dimensional level. Mm-hmm. Now, um, with uh, Eileen McLaughlin, she also said something else pretty interesting. She said that... Um, it was the Sirius B Pleiadians, I guess, that visited Nazi Germany during World War II, the Nordics, and yeah. they are shapeshifters like the indigenous and the Dracos and looked blonde hair and blue blue eyed. That is why Hitler wanted the Aryan race. I would agree with that. Oh. Uh, there's also images 
of Hitler himself shaking hands with a gray, which is in my uh, presentation, which I'm going to release on YouTube pretty soon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Where'd you yeah, get a hold of that? A lot of media coming out, Roxy, and another book. and. Uh, <laughs> Right, right, right. Well, you know, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of groups out there right now talking about um, uh, what you're talking about. You know, they're clearing out the underground bases, they're getting rid of them, they're stomping them out, they're getting rid of all these, um, you know, these uh, reptilians, if you will, and, and garbage, you know, E.T. garbage, so to speak. Um, what about places like Area 51 and S4 and Dulce, uh, New Mexico? What about what about these places? Because aren't it, Area 51 and S4 and S5 are, you know, that's a military operation. That's um, a government operation. So uh, I, I have heard the stories of these tall white beings yep. that, okay, and yep. um, that travel there and, and uh, really... Uh, live there uh come here to stay for a few months they have i guess wives and children the whole nine yards and yeah. quite a quite an interesting i've been to many seminars about this but anyway and of course there's bob lazar who just totally validates the whole idea that there were you know recovered crafts and alien beings etc but what is going to happen to those areas like Area 51 and S4 and S5 and those mountain ranges that are employing extraterrestrial be beings that's a great observation, Rotsky. And the tall whites are out of uh, Indian Springs at the very southern end of the Nellis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And they have what is known as a legacy base. They have been here for a while. And the same with uh, the Greys in a place in the middle of Nellis called Area 55. Not many people have heard of. They have a legacy base. Uh, the Reptilians have several legacy bases uh, Lucian Islands, uh, Solomon Islands, um, and then some of the more benevolent ETs also have legacy bases, uh, Lake Titicaca, Mount Shasta, Antarctica. And basically these legacy bases, you're right, they are born here, they live here, uh, they don't interact too much, but they're very, very interested in how humans are evolving. Um, again, there are service to self and service to others. And the ones that are under uh, water, and there are underwater bases too, mm -hmm. and in some of these remote island regions, they're easier to get at, and they've been easier to extract and remove. Whereas the ETs that operate here in the U.S., well, they say, look, we have a treaty with the military. We're legit. And, in fact, our secret uh, space program is out to protect them. You know, so, so we have our own humans working with them. So, so extracting them from Dulce and Area 51 uh, and Los Alamos is not too easy. In fact, it's very difficult to get at them. One, because we're protecting them. And two, because they have a justification for being here, that A, they were born here, and B, that uh, they have this illegitimate, in my uh, eyes, treaty with the government, which is uh, renewed every 10 years. And it was in 1964 at Holloman Air Force Base when the treaty was renewed. It's every uh, fourth year in a decade, so next year... The treaty is meant to be renewed, and I say it's canceled dull, null and void because it was not approved by the humans of the planet. But back in Holloman Air Force Base in 64, they always do a technology exchange, basically them giving us and us mm -hmm. being the secret government, allowing them to operate. And what they want is human DNA. They're extracting it through uh, abductions, and that's what the whole cattle mutilation phenomenon is about. They're taking out uh, organs and uh, blood cells from cattle, dropping them from the sky, and they're completely mutilated. And that's a whole chapter in my book, too. But uh, this technology exchange in 1964 was when they demonstrated the Yellow Book. It's also been called the Yellow Cube and the Bible. And it is basically a record of everything that has ever happened throughout history, not only on our planet, but every planet. 
And this is the crystalline record, the Akashic records is sometimes called. And it's very accessible with the right kind of technology. So talk about the next killer app. What if we had a right. which would allow us to look at any event in history? There would be no more conspiracies. This is another reason why they have to keep this under wraps, because this ties into time travel. If we were to look back and see all the crimes that were committed, some of these people are still alive, and we can take them into uh, bring justice to them by showing the sequence of what happened. So you can see where every single bullet came at JFK, freeze frame it, right. see the shooter, know exactly what happened. There's, there's going to be no more secrets when this comes out. That's why the stakes are so utterly high to keep this whole thing under wraps. I gotcha. Now, with this age of transparency and 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 living a, a nonviolent, loving life of service, really, and, and compassion for uh, uh, all living things, I would imagine, um, in this age, uh, many are not prepared to live this way. Uh, there are many people on the planet that like their secrets, that like to have secrets that are not authentic in their word. They're not genuine. They're, uh, you know, and so what do you do with, you know, three quarters of the planet that is not prepared, not, not, not wanting? Because couldn't we, Brad, if we wanted to, couldn't we cause an evolution, a quantum leap on our planet? Couldn't we cause that if we oh, wanted? Oh, absolutely. We are. Mm hmm and, and this, this show, I mean, every little bit, every little awakening that people are having all are part of the uh, cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. And that cumulative effect is sooner or later, their cover's blown. The gig is up. We demand to have our future. We demand that this technology be released. And we demand that it's benevolent technology. We can't right. allow this technology to kill or harm or destroy this planet. Right. Well, and there's a cooperation that we need to be having with the planet that the indigenous uh, peoples, uh, indigenous tribes of the planet seem to have had a key. You know, the ancient Mayans, the Native Americans, Native Alaskans, oh, yeah. you know, on and on, right? They had the key to that cooperation with planet Earth that we have completely in the modern age lost that relationship yeah. with. I have a whole chapter in my next book called Primitive Wisdom, and it's all about that, about how the native people in the Andaman Islands saw the animals running for the hills and, and followed them during that uh, great tsunami in uh, 2005, and not a single Andaman Islander was killed in the tsunami, mm -hmm. yet thousands across the uh, Indian Basin were just swept away in the waves. So yeah, yeah, there's that, a lot to be learned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and 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 what would you say? What is that gap that we have? What 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 caused this gap between our ancients and those who are still alive, our indigenous tribes that are still present, who have carried the information, let's say, the stories, the myths, whatever you want to call them, into current modern day. Uh, you know, uh, practice, yet modern civilization has been, how did we get locked out of this? Well, you asked earlier that there's, there made the observation that there were some people that didn't want these mm. secrets to be revealed. Well, yeah, there's still people that want to live in a fantasy world and, you know, <laughs> let them live there. But some of us want to evolve and advance. And I, I, I guess to answer your latest question, how did we get there? Well, Look at technology. A hundred years ago, we were still riding around in uh, horse-drawn buggies, or maybe 150 years. Uh, when you have this trajectory of technology advances, there's going to be some things that are left by the wayside. And, and of course, we should re-explore what it is that primitive people, their sensitivity to nature, for example, and how we can rediscover that ourselves. And, of course, we have that capacity it's just like we're, we're having amnesia in a way. And then we've just got so preoccupied with all these other things in the same way that uh, the Internet has taken out newspapers and, and uh, disrupted so many other business models because it's just this whole new way of thinking, you know. And, and the younger generation, this millennial generation, a lot of them never even owned a landline. And, and one-third of them don't even own televisions. 
So you're seeing this incredible uh, change in, in how uh, people are living and dealing with technology now, for better or for worse. You know, there, there's a lot of things with technology that need to be kept in check and that we need to know more about GMOs and the radiation from cell phones and even Wi-Fi. And yes, uh, be aware of that. Certainly. You know, I have a question about DNA. Yeah. Is there a – are any of these uh, ET civilizations or those who are, you know, the ones in charge, are they screwing with our DNA? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> but they're screwing with it in a way that they're extracting it for their own use. Uh, but we're evolving, and I don't know if you know this, but uh, two or three years ago, the very first three-strand DNA child was born in Britain. And in fact, all of our DNA are showing these little nodes next to the two strands that may become three strands. Now, I don't really think that the ETs are responsible for that. I think it's our own evolution, and it's my understanding that the higher uh, benevolent ETs such as the Pleiadians have actually 12 strands of DNA. So these things that I outline in my book of the superhuman abilities, these are just uh, second nature to 12 strand ETs. Uh, very difficult for us. You could spend your entire lifetime attempting to master something like uh, astral traveling but if you were born with 12 strands of DNA, you would just be born with it and be intuitive with it. And, and more importantly, have been encouraged to grow with it and learn from it and being taught from it your whole life. We don't get any of that on Earth. We get uh, celebrity gossip. Right. Um, well, you know, the, the, the DNA is one, is one, um, one part of it. And um, aren't we tapping into the mind as well, though? Isn't the mind a pretty powerful thing? And aren't we, start, aren't we beginning to learn either we can be creative with our mind and bury, you, know, manifest, you know, manifest with our mind, um, be careful of what we think. Uh, so that we can create the things that we really want and, and, and not create war, not create the things we don't want simply by thinking about them or focusing on the things we don't want too much. Um, so wouldn't you say that the mind as well, regardless if we have two-strand, three-strand, or 12-strand DNA, um, I think our mind will get us there because it's – but we're being pulled into the this collective – you know, like you, you mentioned it early, and I thought it was really cool that every little piece is coming together now. Every little yeah. thing that we do um, is bringing something to the party, so to speak. Right. And um, so isn't it possible that uh, our minds are, sorting, uh, are starting to um, adjust, if you will, to this uh, – I want to call it something, but you could explain it yourself – this this multiverse or multidimensional mm – -hmm place that we live absolutely Isn't, well right yeah, you know what I mean? yeah and and that's that's our evolutionary trajectory we're going to become fourth dimensional human beings it's only a matter of time it's not if it's when and some of us are moving a little more quickly than others you know it's sort of like in school some kids got a's some kids got b's some kids flunked out right people that flunk out well they're just going to be locked in this real dense third dimensional reality but the students who try really hard and want to grasp these things, they're going to move real quickly. And as I said earlier, if you come at this and you're pure of heart and you're treating people around you kind, including animals, things are just going to start working out. In your and we are back with our guest, Brad Olson, author of Future Esoteric, uh, which has been awarded the top honor of 2013 Best Book of the Year in the category of New Age, issued by the Pinnacle Book Achievements Awards. So absolutely stunning. And if you've been listening to the show tonight, it is uh, just a, a, a real fun ride with you, um, um, Brad. This has uh, been very entertaining. I wish you didn't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it just means we'll have to do it again, Roxy. Yes, we will. I mean, this, you're just, you know, got so much information. But, you know, you said something that really touched me, you know. Um, when you live your life in a certain manner and, um, you know, a life of service, a life of love, a, 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 a nonviolent being, somebody who really has come here to really live. I mean, that that's, you're describing life right there. And then to have a rever- reverence for all life truly means that you recognize in all things, not only yourself, but the gift of life. And, um, and what you are imparting to us right now is probably one of the keys, not only to living a, a really fulfilled life, a happy life, but to be able to evolve and and grow and change and not worry about, you know what I mean, not get in behind all this this fear stuff, the fear mongering, and and trip and fall and be so dishonored. Your life force is so dishonored when you do that. When we do that, and um, how did you come to that? How did how did you come to this this understanding? Because you really have it, and it really shines. Oh well, thank you. You know, it was uh, explained to me when I was traveling around the world for three years. Just opened me way up as a young man. What a great experience that was. And I was looking at what it is. How how do we approach this nebulous entity called enlightenment? What what can we do as a person? And it was explained to me that there's three things that we should seek in our lives. And that's charity, compassion, and wisdom. And if you seek those things and let the others just go the wayside Don't get upset about little things, and let's face it, it's all little things. Life is going to throw you a lot of curveballs, and you just have to swing or duck and just be the best human being you can. And I give loose change to homeless people. I smile at people. If I see someone that needs a hand, I'll give it to them. I just am trying to do the best I can with what I can and the limited resources I have. But you know what, Roxy? That's enough. We are all given absolutely everything we need to become these superhumans that I think is our evolutionary destiny to become. If the madmen don't destroy this planet, if we can expose them in time and reclaim this, this great uh, right we have to live on this planet, to have fresh water, to have shelter, to have clean food. And this is not just us wealthy people in the West. This is everybody. And one thing I'd like your listeners to really think about is we're all one. Nobody is any better than anybody else. And this also includes animals. And we have to protect animals and we have to give them rights. Because what's going on right now in the animal kingdom is Holocaust, is atrocious. And any person who is achieving anything towards awareness and compassion has got to see that and has got to see that this is totally wrong. And we need to do as much for ourselves as we do for the animals. And right now we're their masters and species are going extinct every single day. Mm. And it is such, such a terrible tragedy. Yes. And, and I think you're making a very good point, uh, Brad, because this is not part of evolution. You know, you'll hear those faux scientists say, oh, this is just all a part of evolution. No, it's not. So I agree with you when it comes to what I'm, you're referring to the animals and the Holocaust. It's, it's horrible. It hurts me. Hurts me to hear this. Uh, we have a caller at 870 area code. Um, caller, uh, welcome to the Truth Night Talk Radio. And uh, what's your name? And do you have a question for the guest? Yeah, this is all of, uh, all of Tulum on the uh chat room um yeah i have a question we are sovereign spirits we are sovereign uh entities as people you say we're all one but that wasn't my question have you read the gnostic gospels where it talks about um have you read the gnostic gospels i'm familiar with them i mean they're it's quite an extensive body of work and sometimes hard to get through but this is stuff that i'm exploring in my uh next book modern esoteric 
Yeah, because it talks about the uh, the Archon gods and uh, uh-huh. and um, like there was a good, there's there's good gods and there's evil gods, and that's all we know is good and evil. Where it talks about in there, uh, like a woman is both good and don't get mad at me, Roxy. But it, this is what they say that women are both good and evil at the same time. Talks about like a virgin whore. But what I wanted to say is uh, Adam and Eve had a daughter named Noria. And, um, okay, so you didn't read the Gnostic Gospels, so you wouldn't understand how they made two arcs of the covenant, that women at one time were so powerful that she was able to burn the first arc down with her mind, and then they he had to rebuild it because uh, Noah would not let Noria in the ark. So the good God, the good Archon God, uh, is the one that told Noah about the that so that the earth wouldn't be you know destroyed and everybody wouldn't be killed. So there's good and evil in everything. I I was just wondering if you re- you read the you said something about the Nag Hammadi, yeah, you know, that, uh, you know about that. The references to the Archons in there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was wondering because it just seems to me that anybody that um, that's a, this is the biggest one of the biggest secrets that they keep this information away, and that those books were found next to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And oh yeah. boy, we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but when it comes to the Gnostic Gospels, everybody runs and hides. Yeah, that's a good point. It's. Uh... There's a lot of ancient wisdom that we can glean from that. Absolutely. Thanks for the call, Olive. I appreciate it. That's Olive 2M in in the chat room. I think uh, he is a regular listener. Thank you for the call. Um, Well, and and he's making a good point as well, Brad. Uh, It seems that when humans, no matter what uh, level or position um, that person may be in, you know, uh, a boss at a company or uh, a big corporation even or just a small business. But if somebody brings up uh, certain topics, um, the, the room scatters. And why <laughs> is that? You know what I mean? Why is that, that we tend to think that there are certain I don't know if it's conditioning. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's coded in our DNA when you hear this run, Uh, you know, Um, but whatever it is, you run from who's ever talking about it. It it makes you afraid, right? It makes you trip out. And could that just simply be that we have been taught a certain way and we live, you know, in the matrix, let's say? And once we find out that we know that the matrix really does exist yeah. and that we need to bust out of it, it kind of maybe is too surreal to wrap our mind around maybe. <laughs> Great observation, Roxy. When I set out to do this series of books, I had to make an agreement with myself. And it was there are going to be some things that are going to be uncomfortable and there's going to be some things that you might not want to write about or maybe – it's not politically correct to bring it up. And I just had to say to myself, there's nothing under the sun that we can't discuss. There's nothing that we should be afraid of because this is who we are. This is just the human experience here and people need to know this. And, uh, and I've taken that to the nth degree. Now, you know, in certain companies, you don't want to talk about 9-11 being an inside job. So certain companies, I can't talk about ETs or UFOs. And that's fine. You know, people are evolving at their own pace. And I realize I've been working on this full time for four years. So I realize I'm very privy to certain information. And this is, this is what I do. This is all I do is research and look into this stuff. And what seems quite clear to me could be a very confusing paradox to others. So I've set my goal here is to take these very thorny subjects and try to make them understandable, try to make them easy to comprehend because it's very important that people start to realize how complex our world 
and this universe really is. Absolutely, and I could appreciate that as well because the human being is a complexity as well. So we we can gravitate towards this, and we can digest it. And like you said, some are quick and some are slow, but it, we're all gonna we're all gonna get there someday. Um, and that's all that really matters, right? Um, yep. Now you know, free energy is is a really big topic, and we don't have a lot of time to get all the way into this, so we're just going to have to have you back another time. But um, free energy could could literally free the human race. That's established. How do we make that happen? How do we back those individuals who are Tesla-oriented, have taken Tesla's work to a new level, uh, uh, who know how to make energy free, how to utilize energy, and the even technologies that you and I have never even heard of that exist right now? How do we get this to happen? Great question. Uh, I'd say the short answer is we have to out those people that are holding us back. And let's face it, Rockefeller's uh, grandfather, David Rockefeller's grandfather, was the first billionaire on the planet. How do you make his money? Standard oil. They mm-hmm. said they were going to break up the monopoly. They didn't break it up. It just became all the large energy companies that we know. So we have to expose these people, and, and they are responsible for keeping us back. And that's the first step. Two is understanding the technology, cold fusion very much a reality. How did it get such a black eye? Well, that's what they do. They'll throw everything they can at these uh, inventors and they'll try to buy them out first. They'll try to uh, make them some kind of offer. And if they still won't budge, they'll kill them. Roxy, Eugene Malov was about to come out with this great new technology that he was working on he was going to testify in congress he was going to go on coast to coast the next day they found him bludgeoned in his own backyard so these people are ruthless and they need to be exposed and by exposing him is doing exactly what we're doing and talking it through in a non-malicious way like when i say when i want him exposed i want him to put be put on trial i don't want him executed i don't want a, a gang mob to go hang him up Right. Uh, in the streets. We got to do this civilized. We have to do this in a very practical manner, and it can be done. So that's how we're going to go about getting free energy out there. Mm-hmm. And, and would you say that it would also be a good practice as well um, to find those who are uh, trying to get free energy off the ground and support those individuals or support those companies? Oh, of course. I think that that would be another way as well because, sure. you know, that I mean, really, I mean, like you said, I mean, what a terrible thing. He was bludgeoned to death in his own black backyard, and you're right. Uh, Big Oil has been responsible for a lot of deaths, and I'm not going to go any further with that, but you and I both know that. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, speaking of – you know, this is the cabal. This is the yeah. the, the 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 big gang. I call them gang of thieves. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, right. And sure. uh, okay. What what's another way that we can defeat them? Because you made a very good point. Uh, I'm like you, Brad. I can't even if I caught one of these guys or girls or whatever. You know, as mad as I am at them for really screwing things up, I couldn't hurt. I couldn't hurt them. I couldn't hurt them. I couldn't kill them. I couldn't string them up. I, I'd even feel empathetic towards them locking them up the rest of their lives. Exactly. I don't have that it in me. Down to their level. Right. right. But, but I don't feel it. It's not in me. I might be mad and yell and yell, but after I'm done yelling at you, then I'm like, okay, do, you know, I want to play with you now. I want you to come and be friends now. Um, that's just how I am. That's how I was born. That's how, it's not even how I was raised. It's just who I am. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people are like this. I know a lot of people who are like this. Um, so what is, what is the way in which we can defeat them? What is hmm. the means and ways to do that? And you also mentioned you know, the end of money because money is a whore. It's oh, not yeah. people. It's money. And, um, and the use and the misuse and the obsession with money and the way that we have been totally enslaved with money now, that we can't even live without money, even if we want to. Um, if it, put it this way, it's very difficult. 
So how do we defeat the cabal? How do we end money? Hey, that's a great observation, Roxy. We are so both on the same page there. And, and indeed, I have a chapter called Free Energy and another chapter called The End of Money. And you want to know how we defeat the cabal in one fail swoop? We put an end to money. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Societies have it, and we don't need it anymore. We've outgrown it. And that's how we pull the rug right underneath the central bankers and everybody else with a control agenda. Then we're all human beings on a level playing field once again. And look at how quickly we're going to solve our problems. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I never thought about the rug being money. <laughs> gotcha. That's great. That's, that's very clever. Um, well, and uh, how – well, I guess we'd have to go into sustainability and help one another and, and just kind of back one another because we're going to go there anyway. They're already robbing the public. Since 2008, they've been systematically robbing humans out of the stock market, out of bank accounts, and so forth and so forth. There are, they're going to take it anyway. I mean, it's going to, it's going to, the game's over. Well, you know what, Roxy, the longer we keep money, the longer the abuses are going to continue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is the one way to just end it right now. And everybody on the planet is equal. Everybody mm -hmm. gets fresh water, shelter, education, fresh food. We end the GMO. You know, that's the thing. You know, you want to talk about stopping Monsanto. Well, I, and I notice in your uh, in, in on your webpage you talk about chemtrails a lot. We didn't even get into that as part of the control agenda. You know, it, 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 what it's all about this chemtrailing is they're dropping these particulate matters of aluminum, borium, strontium. Guess what? Monsanto's working on right now aluminum resistant seeds. Oh, they're hey, out. You think chemtrails and Monsanto got something going on here? Yeah, it's Gee, a big what a pyramid. coincidence. Mm -hmm. So again, our time is running out because these monsters are making inroads and they're poisoning the planet and doing some very, very terrible things. This has to stop soon or maybe we are getting to the point of no return or it's going to take a long time to recover. How do we get people to understand and what would the message be uh, that comes from yourself? Um, in regards to those who are waiting for someone to save them and those who totally understand that we are totally capable of saving ourselves. <laughs> well, that's exactly it, Roxy. We're all a master. We're all capable of amazing and very powerful things. First of all, we just have to accept that. We have to identify ourselves as having potentially very advanced abilities which in some people if you've read uh, autobiography of a yogi each chapter is about uh, these amazing superhuman abilities and i read this when i was in india and just got me on this tip wow there is so much we can do and we're all capable of it you know it, it's just like uh let's say you want to become a black belt in taekwondo it's not that you walk in the studio and maybe you're really fit and athletic and you're just going to be a black belt. No, you have to put in the time, the hours, the weeks, the months, the years. And then it becomes your power. And you don't lose it. It's like when you learned how to ride a bike when you were a kid. Once you learn it, it always stays with you. And, and that's what putting in the time to develop ourselves as the best people we can be. And as I was saying earlier on the program, wonderful things are going to come as a result of that. And then once enough of us are empowered, you know, it only takes 10% to reach this critical mass called the 100th monkey effect, which I outline in my book. And when we reach that 10% of aware human population, we're going to see a great shift occur. And then the rest of the 90% are just going to come right on along with us. Well, in that tipping point that you're describing um, – you know, is I think it's right around the corner because don't you think that time seems to be going by really fast lately? Like oh, speeding up. Like isn't everything speeding up? <laughs> yeah. Big time. 
you know, it's like I went from a bicycle to a freaking Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, you know, with that in mind, I, you know, just like these events, you know, uh, like the marathon yesterday um, and this, you know, these explosions and um, people, you know, innocent people died and innocent people uh, have lost their limbs. And um, it, 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 it seems like these types of events, I mean, we just had Sandy Hook and then we just had Hurricane Sandy and we just had, you know what I mean? It just seems yeah. like they're culminating. They're happening very quickly now, uh, close together. So um, at the same time, is that an illusion that everything's spinning out of control? Or is it possibly that we're just waking up to that this has been going on all along, all around us, we just never noticed? Well, it has. I mean, mm, this, that's this so cabal, sad. This control group has been around for a long, long time. A lot of them are interbred. Some say are shape shapeshifters, and that's how they stay in power. But look at the ac accumulation of what all these events are. This explosion, these shootings. People get very, very afraid, and for good reason. I mean, it, it's, it's basically our survival mechanisms. And when people are afraid, their minds shut down. When they're fearful, they can't think rationally. This, this is like the, the Mavlov's hierarchy of needs. When you're down there in your base survival instincts, it's flight or f fight. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, how, what do I have to do to survive? And it seems like it's a mad jungle out there, and in many ways it is. But, you know, there's, there's incredible insanity on this planet. And maybe that's why we're here. Maybe we're here to be the ones who wake up to this insanity and try to make a difference. A, a good friend of mine always says, you know, we're here in earth school and this is like uh, what we have to learn to become uh, more advanced and move on and do what we need to do. But, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course it is. It's a, there's all different explanations for it, but the bottom line is everything is happening as you described so beautifully. Everything's happening right now. Everything's happening in this moment. Um, and we have the ability um, although I do find it very interesting, this um, uh, this technology exchange of 1965, the Akashic Records, whatever you want to call it, is that going to come out? Is they, are we going to eventually be able to see the timeline of everything that's ever happened? <laughs> I sure hope so. That it was actually so in 64 fun. in Holloman Air Force Base, and I encourage your uh, listeners to look it up. And everything I've talked about is very much researchable online. Thank God we have the Internet. And yeah, I think here's here's something for you. A final thought: everything that a human has done, from the most primitive human of all, who's still living in the Stone Age in some locations in Papua New Guinea and the Amazon, to some of these humans that are part of this breakaway civilization, which are living in spaceships now orbiting Earth and are hundreds of years advanced, there is a memory. There is a connection between the primitive and the advanced that all of us can tap into. Because what I was saying earlier, that we're all one, That were internationally distributed through independent publishers group so a wide reach and range of uh possibilities to order this book mm -hmm. and um great and and we'll also advertise that for you um uh, after the show um and we'll just keep that on our website so you know if anybody's looking for your stuff they'll find it um now can we dive into the book? Can we talk about some of the subject matter that is in the book? Let's do it. No, oh, I love it. So I think I think um, I'm going to go right now with one of my favorites. Um, uh, you know, 
who are the men in black? Can we start there? Who are they? I mean, are they real? Well, it, it's a great question. And this is basically starting in the very middle of the book. I break it up in three sections. We start out in the secret section, then mm-hmm. it goes into the cosmos section, and then there's the utopia section. So right in the middle of the cosmos section are is the men in black chapter. And you know, Roxy, I try to be as objective and out of the picture as far as my opinion goes as possible and just lay down what's known. What are the facts? And I should just uh, preface by saying that by using the title esoteric, this is a term that literally means it's only understood or practiced by a select few people. This is not information that I think is really ready for the whole world to understand, but the people who are feeling that there is more of a story than the alternative, than, than the regular narrative, uh, will really latch on to this book because it does delve into every one of these subjects, including the men in black. So to answer your question, it, it could be a number of things. It could be a uh, secret service type, very much human uh, government agents, uh, or it could be more of an ET nature. Now, to, to define it, the men in black are always associated with phenomenon. And by that, I mean anything from a UFO sighting to even Bigfoot sightings to anomalies in the sky to even possibly time travel visitors. Now, what makes the men in black so unique is they are Johnny on the spot. They are there right away. They are so quick to intercept witnesses that they get to this person before they even make a phone call, before they even tell someone what they've just seen. They're visited. And when they are visited, these characters are very creepy. For one, they don't have mannerisms quite like we do. They do things that are really quirky, like they don't know how a pen works or a spoon. Uh, they, they speak in sort of this old 1950s style English. They wear the old style clothes of the 1950s. They even drive big old black Cadillacs from a bygone age. So, so that alone makes it kind of a suspicious or, dare I say, esoteric subject. But what's really the trippiest thing about the men in black is they're extremely telepathic and they will put pictures in these people's heads. They will not threaten them physically, but they will threaten them telepathically in such a way that the person who has just had this paranormal experience feels compelled to not want to talk about it. And then the men in black that uh, have changed because of Dr. Will Spencer in my life and some of the friends that Dr. Will Spencer uh, has been working with, some of my personal friends, some for many years. Um, So there you have it. And of course, I'm really excited. Um, uh, This is going to be the first time that uh, my guest, Brad Olson, is going to be on the show. We're going to dive into some subject matters like, you know, what is secret government and what's the Third Reich and, um, you know, what are secret science? Sciences. Oh, I can't wait to hear about that. What's backward engineering? And who are the men in black? And uh, topics as such as these. I can't. I can't wait. We're just going to race into it and dive into it. A little bit of background on my guest tonight. Um, you know, he's an author. He's a publication contributor. Uh, he gained the distinction of an award-winning travel writer title in February of 2010 when his travel guide, Sacred Places in North America, 108 Destinations, uh, won the Bay Area Travel Writers' Top Gold Prize Award. Congratulations, first place winner for the 2010 Best Travel Book for the Planet Earth category. So uh, this is absolutely fabulous. His syndicated Sacred Destination travel column for the examiner.com is available both as a national column and a local profile for San Francisco the city where he currently resides Brad is a travel columnist for Yahoo uh, contributor network so he is also a contributing editor for the World Explorer magazine oh my gosh I can't keep up with this man and he has written several rough guides uh, titles including World Party Guide he has a passion for publishing obviously 
and very good at it, um, has uh, been a published artist since he was 14 years old. Get that. Talk about somebody who goes after their dream and follows their heart. Uh, starting in 1979 as a political cartoonist for his high school newspaper, he continued his craft five years later at Illinois State University's college newspaper. His comic strip was renowned for its witty and satire and biting criticisms, and a decade later he founded Consortium uh, Consortium of Collective Consciousness Publishing in San Francisco, the city where his office is still located. The company has produced 12 books, uh, titles including In Search of Adventure, a wild travel anthology featuring 80 different authors. Wow. And uh, Key to Solomon... Uh, Key to Solomon's Key is the Lost Key of Masonry by Lon Milo Duchetti was released in the second edition in 2010. Brad's first book, World Stompers, a Gold Travel Manifesto, now in its fifth edition. You want to be Brad, I'm telling you. In its fifth edition was lauded by film director Oliver Stone, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that name, as a super, uh, I'm sorry, subversive masterpiece of travel writing. And Publishers Weekly labeled it a quirky chain pleaser. His travel website relating to the book, www.stumpers.com, was Microsoft Network's site of the week and continues to rank as a top 5% Lyco site. Uh, the latest book released by uh, CCC Publishing was The Tribes, uh, The Tribes of Burning Man, I should say, by Stephen T. Jones, which won third place in the 2011 Sharp Wit Award for Best Nonfiction Book of the Year. And I could go on and on, but I'm going to bring Brad on here because I'm sure he's just more exciting than I am at this moment. I could go on and on about his background, but let's dive into all these subjects matter and uh, get a little piece of Brad tonight. If you have questions, please be for sure to put them in the chat room or join the event page on Facebook. Um, you already have some questions there, and I'm sure you'll be coming from chat. If you want to call in, we'll wonderful. We can put you to work, no problem. Um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And if any of you do want to donate, just go to thetruthnight.com. There's donation buttons. Just click them. And um, like I said, any money in any form is um, good for us and helps us. We have domain renewals and host renewals, host site renewals. We want to expand. Expand. We want to continue to expand, and you, you you make that very possible for us. We're having trouble with Google and YouTube. We have been able to self-support ourselves until about four months ago. Some way, somehow, we don't know what's happening, um, and we're not the only ones. Um, somehow, they're not paying for paying us anymore and we don't know why um and we've written them and as if anybody has a youtube account or youtube channel or a a blog site you know you know this is happening to you as well and there is nobody to write there is no one to write so um it's uh, all over the blogs at google and people are asking what's happening what what has happened meanwhile google unfortunately uh is still running all the ads on millions of websites and um Hopefully they'll straighten it out, and I would just want to put a prayer out to that because many, many bloggers are writing me, and they're not going to be able to continue, and this is very unfortunate. So some of them are going to come over with us for a little while, and we're happy to assist. We're happy to get your word, your information out there. We're a highly trafficked website. Uh, we have a lot of traffic, and again, we are growing exponentially so again thank you thank all of you who share our websites and our radio shows and speaking of volunteers revolution radio for those of you who do not know uh we have uh, many many hosts here i don't even know how many of my producer can give me a number that would be great um but i have no idea uh, 20 30 hosts i don't know every one of us are volunteers uh revolution radio was founded and set up by uh uh, Mike Wrigley, uh, we fondly call him and is known as Hawk because he's a night hawk. He works around the clock. He funded this. He put this station together about a year and a half ago. And we do – oh, thank you, uh, Kat. We have 45 or more hosts. Every one of us are volunteers, and we put together, as you well know, 
substantial awareness shows with guests like the guests that we're going to have on this evening. And, um, you know, we also make videos out of these shows. Um, Revolution uh, Radio's website on YouTube has the shows there. And, of course, we have them at The Truth Denied. And we also do articles and we give you all the information for our guests. If you write us and you have questions for the guests, we forward those to our guests it never ends so we are forming that information chain and together we can all do this and so those of you who are listeners and readers like i say you know a lot of people are very broke right now they don't even have five dollars to donate and that is fine you can do something you can share the information with others and that that really helps us all out so thank you again um for the most part we do continue our work and we are honored to have so many of you who support our work so once again thank you and many blessings next week thursday uh there's another show that i do it's a television show tribe tv so next thursday at uh one o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time will be doing another episode of GIC with o- the GIC owner Bernard Alvarez and of course myself so watch for the ads that will be coming up next week on the show uh, we'll also have uh, back to the show uh, one of your favorites and one of mine Dr. Will Spencer and some friends and we're going to talk about a few things go to the uh, schedule page on the truth denied really easy to find and check out some of the topics that we're going to uh, be um, uh, further knowledge for all of you on and um, we're even going to share a little bit I'm going to share a little bit with um, some personal things that have been going on take questions at the top of the second hour you can call in write the number down 347-688-2902 without any further ado welcome to the show Brad Olson how are you hey Roxy thanks for having me on you sound you're very welcome. You sound like a, a really fun guy. You're you're uh obviously um been around the world. Uh, 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 how we obviously know a little bit about how you got involved in this, but travel guides, interesting. How did you what is the passion with you with that? What are you turning people on to? Well, as you said in the setup piece, uh my first book, World Stompers, a global travel manifesto, was uh written and produced in the mid-1990s, right when I came back from a three-year trip around the world, totally self-financed. I was an English teacher in Japan and then set off on my own with a backpack solo, saw the world at a young age, and it was like getting another college degree, in some ways even more valuable to what I've been doing with my life, of course, because I got into uh, travel writing and so many other things. And I should just point out before I forget, uh, in my bio that I sent you, I haven't even up. Well, I didn't update with you, but uh, Future Esoteric, which we're going to talk about tonight, has won uh, its first award. It won the uh, Pinnacle Award for the best travel book uh, in the New Age category, best nonfiction book, I should say. So that's kind of cool. Well, I, and of course, that's the name of the show um, for tonight. And I was going to get into that with Future Esoteric. Yes, that's very cool. What does it mean? What does to be a future esoteric? What does that mean? Right. Well, you know, conspiracy theory as a term is really overworked and it's a loaded term. And even though I love Jesse Ventura's show, who you, which uses <laughs> that phrase, I, I just had to look for something else. And while future esoteric really doesn't have anything to do with traveling, it's kind of traveling of the mind is about the closest parallel there is. But what I've done is covered all the subjects that are not part of what I call the mainstream narrative in life. So everything that we're taught that we know from Columbus coming here over 500 years ago to the man on the moon and never been in contact with ETs, well, there's an entire alternative narrative on top of that. And these subjects are nothing short of being very esoteric subjects. And that's why the the word loans itself so well. And not only is it this book, but I've got uh, Modern Esoteric Beyond Our Beliefs, which is actually the first in the series coming out in nine months. So i got a lot of work ahead of me right now. Yeah, it sounds like it. Busy guy. Um, and I look forward to your work. Um, I think it's absolutely fabulous. And I love that you covered some of the topics. And I understand what you mean when you say, you know, th- just the word conspiracy uh, alone um, brings up a lot of 
frustration for people, you know, uh, they hear the, <laughs> right? They hear the word yeah, and they're absolutely. like, oh God, another one of those conspiracies. Yeah. I don't think people even really understand what a conspiracy is, <laughs> you know, when it really boils down to it. But um, I do, um, where can people get the book? Just why don't we just let them know that right ahead, uh, ahead of the show. Uh, we did drop some links into the chat room. So which one of those links can they get your book, uh, Future uh, well, Esoteric? Well, directly, you can get it off of cccpublishing.com, which is our publishing house's website. It's also on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, carry it. It should be in most uh, bookstores. If not, you can request it. Revolution Radio proudly presents, live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's Tuesday, the 16th of April, and um, I'm getting a strong echo. I don't know what's going on here. Um, but anyway, we are um, live on the air from Phoenix, Arizona, and um, uh, we'll bring on to the show in a moment uh, our guest, Mr. Brad Olson. You've heard about him all week long, and of course, we've been advertising him on the front page of The Truth Denied. I want to wish... Um, everyone that was connected, uh, you know, to the Boston Marathon runners and that uh, hor- horrific uh, bombs that were set off and all the people that were injured and now deceased, I am uh, just sending love and, and blessings to all of you. You know, we had uh, out of the state of Arizona uh, about 250 runners in that marathon, and I did get a, a chance to hear um, for, uh, you know, d- testimony, whatever you want to call it, uh, of those who were there, you know, fresh out of the marathon, uh, heading toward uh, airports and such. And it's just a very interesting unfoldment. I did cover it. I covered uh, Obama's uh, press to the nation, um, which was very short. And um, yesterday, so that everybody can follow through, I was also on the Boston police uh, Twitter um, as they were tweeting out what they were going to do next, etc. And uh, I'm very well aware of all the aspects and the conspiracies and the um, the anger that the public, you know, the public is outraged by this. And of course, um, it's not too hard to connect the dots to see um, perhaps what's going to come out of this. Um, um, I, again, it's um, real important, people, that you don't buy into the fear um, that's propagated every day of our lives in this country and all over the world. It's just not helpful. Um, fear can be a motivator in, in some cases, but over the long haul, it will kill you. You know, So I'm, that's just my personal reminder. I also want to remind you that The Truth Tonight is a volunteer organization, and uh, we are uh, currently uh, in need of donations. We want to thank those of you who have been donating this week. And, um, you know, no donation is too small. And, of course, no donation is too large. Is That's how we look at it. And um, these donations that have been coming in, this says a lot about you, the listeners and the readers. So we much appreciate it. Um, some of what we do at The Truth Tonight as a reminder is we expand public awareness as well as connect our readers, guests, and listeners with one another, uh, forming a global information chain, if you will, of those who want to be part of changes uh, for the better in our world. And um, so. So join us. You know, uh, I want to thank those of you who've been emailing asking what you can do to volunteer. You don't have money, but you'd like to volunteer your services. Wonderful. 